A warm welcome to all of you uh, this evening. Thank you very much for being with us as we start this new uh, Labour Lecture Series. And uh, we've had some success with these Good Society Lectures over the years. We've had three um, more recently. We had uh, John Cruddus, who of course is leading a lot of work for the Labour leader. And he talked about um, his vision of a good society. We've had David Lammy, who talked a lot about families and the Good Society, and then Graham Allen, who told us about his pioneering work with early intervention. And because the CSJ really is, of course, in the business for ideas, and we really want to give people platforms who have interesting things to say about society and social reform, as well as to promote our own ideas. And I know David's lecture this evening is going to be really fascinating, and you've probably been tracking today some of the work he's been doing on the Today programme, Daily politics, he took down Will Self pretty impressively this morning on the day yeah. program. Um, I think we all agree, David. So um, we're excited about what you have to say. And 15 months ahead of the general election, of course, this is a timely moment to be considering uh, the theme that David will speak on. More of that in a second. But I just wanted to take this chance for 10 minutes on something that's related to talk about a process underway at the CSJ and give a, a short update. Uh, many of you will know that in 2005, the CSJ led and then published a few years later a report called Breakthrough Britain, which was a major review of the causes and consequences of social breakdown across the UK. Some of it has been influential with the coalition and with the Labour Party, some of it not so influential. That's the way, of course, things go. But six years on from publication, we felt it was time to look again at the Breakthrough Britain work. And the review is a year into its journey. About this time, Last year we launched it and we said we were going all over the country to take an assessment of the challenges we face but also some of the work that's being done to transform lives and deal with disadvantage around the country. And we wanted to find lessons and examples of things we could present to the political community. So we've been travelling, we've covered 8,000 miles in 12 months across the country. We've seen 400 organisations, almost 200 of them are visited um, by the team, 250 hours of evidence, 80 sessions, uh, polled more than 6,000 people by the end of the process, and we've of course looked overseas as well to see which other countries are doing these things better than we are. And we're building that process around six themes, and these six themes we think can transform lives in some of the difficult communities around the UK, and they are family stability, education, work, help with personal debt, and freedom from drug and alcohol abuse. And the sixth thing we're looking at is the role of civil society and the voluntary sector. And we've presented some of the analysis so far, our state of the nation reports, if you like, across those six themes. And a word on each of them, because I think we were able to reveal something very important about each. In regard to the work on families, we found that a million children now in this country have no meaningful contact with their father, and we made the argument that that mattered. And we've seen growing levels of family instability in some of the poorest parts of the country. And again, we really think that family instability matters in terms of life chances, and we can't just dismiss it as uh, the way things go. Uh, we've also considered how the education system plays a role or not in tackling disadvantage. We found that a uh, quarter of a million uh, children don't get five A star to C grades, including maths and English. We've seen that white British boys, interestingly enough, who are on free school meals, achieve well below others who are on free school meals. And they continue as a group to fall further behind. And we know actually as a measure that free school meals only gets us so far. Because if you look, for instance, at 80% of those who don't achieve A to C in English or maths at GCSE, 80% uh, of them who don't achieve that are not on free school meals. So it's not the be-all and end-all as a measure. We wanted to look at that. With regards to worklessness and unemployment, uh, we've seen that even in an austerity parliament, this government will spend more than £1 trillion on social security. Now that, of course, includes the state pension, but a good proportion of that goes on people who are of working age. 20 million families now receive some kind of benefit. More than 4 million working age families rely on benefits for more than half of their uh, income. We know that during a period of record growth uh, until 2008, millions of people remained stuck 
out of work in the welfare system. And we know youth unemployment is really still um, a fire that no government has ever even come close to putting out despite the best of intentions. So there are some fascinating dynamics taking place with regard to work. We've looked closely at people who are struggling with personal debt. We've spent a lot of time with families and individuals locked in that spiral of debt because we've seen how it can lead to so much more difficulty. Household debt in this country now tops 1.4 trillion pounds. There's a lot of debate about the national debt, but there is a huge debt burden on families and individuals around this country. One and a half million people have no transactional bank account. They're excluded from that practice, and eight million people have no savings at all. So in terms of financial resilience and inclusion, we've got some work to do. When it comes to drugs and alcohol, we've seen that tragically one person a week now is dying from use of legal highs, and alcohol-related deaths have doubled since 1991. So some really difficult social challenges out there. But what we're also trying to do, which is far more interesting and exciting, is to find the things that will make the difference and things that we can do as a political community and, frankly, as a country, to turn this around. And we've looked at the role of the civil society and the social sector, and we've seen some challenges. We know that um, there is still a dominance of so-called mega-charities who uh, will, will trample on, unintentionally at times, the smaller organisations that can achieve so much. And we know, and we've seen, and we've heard from smaller charities who kind of get the principle of things like payment by results, but they just don't quite know how to navigate that at this stage. But we found some of the most inspiring work we've ever seen over the last 12 months too. And lives being changed from the darkest of situations and circumstances and bringing people through as individuals, as families, and therefore the, the transformative effect that have, has in, in their communities. And we're really excited about promoting that. And the importance of this work and the context of it really matters because if you look at the nature of the debate at the moment, 15 months out from a general election, uh, we can see how people are on the margins, people caught in these issues, can easily be <coughs> overlooked. They can become an afterthought, really, for people planning for government, not necessarily the priority. If you look at the way that perhaps the clamour for votes starts to kick in now, polling uh, is driving a lot of what we hear from different political parties, understandably, but they want quick wins and they want to reach the electorate who will turn out in June 2015 to vote for them or not. And some of the group we've been looking at and spending time with this year won't be part of that clamour. Secondly, it's a really a race for the middle classes. We used Ed Miliband last week in The Telegraph declaring that only he could save the middle classes now. It's fascinating to see how that debate is playing through. Living standards, of course, being the way that Labour are looking to set a debate. Thirdly, we see the poverty debate often focused around the working poor, a really important group, a really important section of the society, doing everything right, playing by the rules, working all hours, but not having enough to get by. There is, though, a second group below the poverty line, and this is perhaps where our work kicks in, who are much more entrenched and further from the workforce, and we want to make the argument that it's not just about the working poor as you plan for power in 2015. And of course, with the economic situation we face, there is an imperative we get this right for the Treasury too. So as the debate turns to what we can save and how we can deliver government, good government, in an era of less money, it's important the CSJ is making the case for that on behalf of people who don't get a hearing particularly often as we approach general election. So there's a lot of good work being done by the think tank. The team's working incredibly hard to make sure that between May and the summer uh, and the autumn this year, we present a, an exciting, credible, transformative agenda for anyone, any political party who wants to take office in 2015. We know it's a good tradition in the Labour Party, and we saw even most recently under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, the work of the Social Exclusion Unit, which led so much good discussion in the uh, early parts of the Labour government, and we're building on that. We also know the current social justice agenda in government does command a lot of cross-party support when you turn the TV cameras off, uh, at least, and we recognise that that is a part of the political process. So I hope this project is going to make a real difference, and we will bring some really solid ideas through. That's enough from me, though, and... Um, I'm really excited tonight that we've got um, David with us. And as we've been considering as a think tank, 
the, the disenfranchised because of social deprivation. I think what we're here tonight is a challenge to us as an organisation, as an audience, and as a country, frankly, as you've been doing this afternoon on the BBC and this morning, is the disenfranchisement of people as a result of um, a culture and an assumption that says don't bother politically. And you've, of course, identified certain celebrities who are making the case. I must declare an interest. I'm working a bit with Russell Brand on drug treatment at the moment, so um, I'd better be careful with what I tell him about today, David. But um, you're absolutely right. I agree with you and not him on this issue. Uh, David, of course, was elected to Parliament in 1987, served in a number of really important roles in the Shadow Cabinet, and he became Education and Employment Secretary as they became into office, Home Secretary and then Worker Pension Secretary. An incredible view from government as he looked down to this country. And he's now, of course, Chairman of our Advisory Board as a think tank, a valuable friend to the organisation. He's written, uh, since moving on to the back benches, about um, the defence of politics and the purpose of engaging in, in it. So um, tonight's lecture is called Reconnecting the British People with the Political Process. If you want to tweet, uh, you're uh, very welcome. I think the hashtag is CSJ Good Society. David, we're really delighted that you're here. Thank you so much for being with us. And please welcome David. As it comes. Well, th thank you very much uh, to CSJ, to you, Christian, for the invitation, and above all, for, for all of you coming um, this evening. When I was on the Today programme this morning with Will Self, now, there's a name to conjure with. Um, uh, I, I thought he might actually have had an explanation as to why he called all those who are engaged in any way with the political process and party members he picked out in particular as donkeys. Um, I was hoping to be able to pursue this a bit further because donkeys at least get carrots and the volunteers who commit themselves weekend after weekend, night after night, in all the major political parties get absolutely nothing except drenched. Uh, and, you know, I remember when I first joined the Labour Party uh, in Shrewsbury and then I moved to Sheffield. And in, in Sheffield, we had one of those branches which were in danger of telling people that they were already full. Um, we had this syndrome about, oh God, it's so long ago, I can't remember. We met in a, what can only be described as a mizzen hut. And uh, we had to find the caretaker who got the key. And when we got in, we had to light a, a, a coke fire. And at the end of about three months of this, I did wonder what the hell I was doing because it was a really difficult exercise and I think most people who have been involved heavily with politics know that it is a real grind and we have to do two things. Firstly, we have to stop abusing those who are prepared to give their lives to doing it and secondly, we need to stop it being a grind. I think it is a bit better now, especially in London, they meet in wine bars instead of visiting <laughs> uh, so that's a bit better. Um, we also need to elevate the debate. I'm, I'm pleased that some colleagues are here tonight, and particularly, if people will forgive me, say I'm pleased that Tim Lawton's here tonight, because you won't know this, but back in 1992, Tim was the Tory candidate in Sheffield Brightside. Now, that was a thankless task, if ever <laughs> there was one. But we, I mean, I, I could afford to be um, magnanimous, but I think we conducted the election in a very good spirit, and we were able to debate issues rather than kicking the man and can I just say tonight um, I, I, one or two people will forgive me I know that we, we lost a great champion of tackling yeah, yeah. policy Absolutely. not kicking the man or the woman uh, in Paul Goggins and uh, it was very sad to gather for his funeral last Thursday. I, I also just want to say that you know in reflecting on this debate if you can get people involved and engaged in any way at all, you start to break through the, the ice of them understanding that politics with a small p is not simply about elections and voting or even political parties. When I was at school in Shrewsbury, um, in, in my teens, I, I started volunteering to go and see an old lady called Mrs. Plum. And I used to go every Saturday morning because it wasn't boarding school. And I realised something at the time I was leaving, and Mrs Plum knew I was coming down to say goodbye because I was going back to Sheffield. And I went to say to Mrs Plum, 
I'm really pleased I've been able to volunteer. I hope I've been of some real value to you. And before I could say it, Mrs. Plum said, come in, David. I just wanted to say this morning that after all these months that you've been coming, I hope I've really been of some value to you. <laughs> uh, and of course, it's, it was a two-way street. Um, I learned quite a lot about Mrs. Plum, but I learned as much about myself. And I think getting people to feel that they can make a contribution is half the battle in getting people to engage rather than disengage, to feel that they're connected rather than alienated from society around them. I, I won't tonight go into the asset divide. I hope to make a, a contribution on that later in the spring. But the, the divide on assets reminds me of some work we did when I was at Education and Employment. I have to confess it was funded by the taxpayer, but it was in a good cause. We were actually trying to ascertain what was it that connected people with public service and with the public sphere. And the research proved what in, intuitively all of you would know, which is if you have some stake of any kind in the community around you, in society, you're likely to be engaged in that public sphere and you're also likely to vote. And that stake was, given that uh, Christians mentioned that 8 million people don't have any savings, just having a small nest egg, just having some savings, uh, having an investment in your own home, actually having a connection with post-16 education uh, was a, a connection uh, and a, a route into people feeling as though they got something that they value in themselves and that they got something to lose. In fact, I once asked Tony Blair what on earth he thought he was doing with the triumvirate in the Middle East and whether he was doing any good. And he actually said that the lesson he'd learned from Northern Ireland was that if you could act, manage to get people to feel that their connection with where, where they were and the society around them meant that they'd got something to lose. There was just a chance they might start talking about, thinking about protecting that and, uh, and their way <coughs> engendering peace. And, and I think that's quite a big lesson to learn as well. We, we are divided in all sorts of ways and that's you know, part of being a, a very mixed and, and, and diverse society. But the divide that I wanted to just talk about tonight and I think it's a dangerous divide, is those who are, for all sorts of reasons, completely switched off the political process, and those who are engaged and understand the importance of influence. I want to say that I think we've got a part to play in the political arena. It's dangerous to say this, but I think we need to be more honest about what influence we have, but more importantly, more honest about what influence we don't have, in other words, to actually examine the role of government and the place of government in a very pluralistic society, much more pluralistic than when I first joined the political process as a member of the Labour Party just over 50 years ago. The global economy is obviously growing in pace. It's not that this has not existed. I mean, we are a trading nation, and therefore trade across the world was was our, our business of survival. So globalism has been on our agenda for hundreds of years. But actually, the global economy and global influence has never been greater. And it changes the terms within which we do our politics. Uh, dare I mention it, the European Union. But it would, if it wasn't there, we'd still be engaged, uh, either bilaterally or multilaterally, with, with other countries in World Trade Organization and other bodies, where we would seek to influence others by joining together with others, either nationally or across political parties or across groups, whether that's business or trade union uh, or social groups. So I'd like us to be more honest about what it is that we can do from government in this modern era and how we can reshape our parliamentary democracy to meet that challenge, including, of course, the devolution agenda and pray God that the Scots don't vote for the breakup of the United Kingdom but whether they do or they don't we're living with substantial devolution and we need to come to terms with that. So the honesty is firstly about what it is we're dealing with 
and therefore how we can bring influence to bear in the formal political arena, how we can support others in bringing influence to bear in the informal political arena with the small p. Uh, I'm, I'm always referring to this in speeches, but I think it's a good example. And that was back in 2004-05, there was a global movement, but it was particularly in Europe and North America, called Make Poverty History. And a lot of people, particularly young people, joined hands together to actually get the message across to political <coughs> leaders that change was necessary in terms of the way we dealt with world debt, particularly debt in Africa, with climate change, with the big global issues. And a lot of people suddenly thought that they had some chance of providing influence. Now, you needed politicians of all persuasions in senior positions to be willing to consider change, to be, if you like, able to take the tide of opinion and to ride it and to be able to use it to bring about substantial improvement in the lives of others. And at that moment in time, in the build-up to the G8 in July 2005, you had that movement. And a million and a half young people, and not so young, walked through Edinburgh deeply impressively. There were the big concerts here and across the rest of the world here in Hyde Park as well, which got the attention because they were celebrities. Now, that was celebrity doing a good job, although not all of them seem to have recognised that they were engaged in small p politics. Um, they didn't seem to understand that they were actually playing a key part in encouraging others to be engaged themselves. But that movement actually had an impact. And when they met at Glen Eagles, they did agree substantial change in terms of the um, cancellation of debt in Africa, and some change in, in terms of moves towards climate change. And I think then we, we sort of lost the plot. I mean, actually some of the significance and impact of that was lost because of the other side of the coin, when people aren't engaged in democratic politics, but engaged in criminal and terrorist behavior, because of course, uh, on the 7th of July, while they were meeting at Glen Eagles, we had the terrible attacks on the underground and Telestock Square. Uh, and that, of course, is the other side of the disengagement agenda, because we need to be able to persuade people that democracy is about bringing about peaceful change, and that people's views can be respected, and that people will be heard. So it's important to contrast these two. It's also, I think, important to translate day-to-day -day concerns of people into an interest in participation, not just in demanding change from the formal political process, i.e. governments, but actually their participation in the process. I mean, I'm actually pleased that um, we've been debating something as fundamental as the cost of living, but I do think that in debating that, we also need to put alongside it what is it that we can enable people to do in their own lives to actually change the conditions in which they live? And I'll come back to that in a minute. Because my old professor, Bernard Crick, uh, who was my, my tutor and stayed my friend till, till his death, uh, instilled a number of things in me. In his defense of, uh, in defense of politics book back in 1962, which was a seminal work, uh, he spelt out that politics was a messy business, that you were going to end up getting your hands dirty. Uh, firstly, because you weren't perfect, none of us are, and we struggle to uh, actually match our, our own objectives and our own benchmarks with our behaviour. But also because we have to compromise, we have to agree to do business with others around us, just as we do, by the way, in the family. I mean, we don't all agree where we particularly like to go on holiday, so we we compromise, or at least these days we do. I suspect in the past, families, certain members of families gave way rather than fighting back. So democracy is coming alive in family, Christian, mm. uh, and family stability needs to be built on respect for each other and the ability to be able to work through differences and times when frictions exist. So there is a the, the mediation we offer to families and they ability to hold them together is, is part of 
the embryo of political process that we try and re uh, re rejoice in on the public platform. He also taught me, Bernie Crick, the, the, the fact that political democracy was about a counterweight to other forms of major power, obviously wealth and privilege, but also the, the movement of global capital which has taken off and the way in which those forces affect all our lives. And of course what happened in 2007-8 with the banks is a, a, a clear demonstration of that. And the importance of the counterweight of political democracy being able to spot what's going wrong and to balance that through regulation, although actually it, it's easier said than done because the minute you start to regulate, the accusation comes that government are interfering into the uh, unnecessarily in the market or into the lives of other people or into business, uh, which is seen by some as a bad thing. But the third thing that Bernard actually spelt out was none of what we did in the political arena would ever work unless people were themselves part of the process. So enrolling people as engaged citizens, going back to the polis and the, 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 the Greek states, was for him a really important part of whether people were genuinely full citizens of a nation and how we could encourage them to be engaged. Well, civil society, which uh, the Centre for Social Justice have been involved in and interested in as part of Breakthrough Britain and Breakthrough Britain too, is very close to my heart. Um, let me tread on dangerous territory. When David Cameron started to talk about the big society, um, he received quite a lot of ridicule, I think partly because of the name big society. But some of us at the time actually said, we mustn't just dismiss the intention and the principle behind it, because if we're talking about engaging people in civil society in their own lives and finding solutions for themselves, then that should be uh, something to encourage and support, not just in its own right, but from government as part of the way in which government will operate and proceed in the years to come. And perhaps I could just give a, a, a practical example from the debate about living standards. I'm fully in favour, I would be, wouldn't I, of my own party's policy in terms of the energy companies providing a breathing space by freezing prices in order to be able to re-regulate <coughs> the way the market operates. But I think actually we can only do a really long-term job on empowering people to take on the large energy companies and to do themselves a favour by reducing their energy bills if we mobilise people as consumers to come together in mutual support to negotiate lower bills themselves. It's the principle of the trade union movement in terms of negotiating wages and conditions all those years ago, and still is. But we don't spell it out as well as we might in terms of the consumer. It is only one example. I'm sure we will be able to develop in the future others. But the big <coughs> switch, which has been effective in some parts of the country, not right as well as I would have hoped, and not universally, but in the West Country, they did a really good job in getting 37,000 families to agree to sign up. And to get the bills down by several hundred pounds is a great achievement for a family in a particular year, and we shouldn't knock it. And it goes alongside because it is about active citizenship. It's about people being able to do something for themselves by working alongside uh, and with others. So, you know, we can, we can develop that a bit further, perhaps because this kindly from you, Christian, is a lecture from a Labour politician. Can I say that Edna Laband at the weekend floated just the embryo idea of what work might be done through which the Consumer Association and through Citizens Advice. I'd like to see all parties start to develop the idea of the consumer voice by supporting from government, enabling if you like, because I'm in favour of enabling government, organisations that have the reach and the wherewithal to be able to inform and educate consumers so that they themselves can play a part in the challenge. 
writ large, I mean, this is me being a bit sort of optimistic, I think, writ large, it could help consumers to take into their own hands the challenge against those, for instance, in big business who don't feel it appropriate to acknowledge the payment of corporation tax. I mean, if people didn't buy their coffee at a particular chain, then the chain would soon change their minds, not just about giving a small voluntary donation to the Treasury, but actually playing the game in terms of where the money's being made and where the tax should be paid. And I, I just think it's worth exploring that area as a way of engaging people. So the cynicism that comes with, oh, well, you can't change anything in politics politicians and politics, they're all the same and nothing will happen, would start to be eroded because people would see what's happening around them as positive change. Now, there's all sorts of things happen with who you elect and when you get engaged, you can see small things taking shape around you, but we don't spell them out. We don't <coughs> actually relate what's happening in the neighbourhood to the small p political process so that people don't think that it's anything to do with politics. You talk to people about, you know, the development of a, a luncheon club for older people and just a small grant that may be available now because of the austerity measures from the local authority. But that is about political engagement. It's about people taking hold of and doing something in their own lives. I'm very strongly in favour of neighbourhood budgeting, which the coalition government are experimenting with, again you don't hear about it very much, I'd like it to be spread very rapidly. I'd like people in their neighbourhood to be not just consulted but engaged in the difficult, really eye-wateringly difficult decisions as to how you save basic provision in entirely new ways. And it will mean some of us on the centre-left having to accept in the new landscape that we'll be rebuilding the delivery of public services from the bottom up in entirely, well not entirely new ways, in ways which were actually experimented with and were necessary years ago before the development of both local government and central government taking over and uh, actually providing rather than supporting and enabling. Uh, in the early days of municipal enterprise, people actually did come together and they were part of the process of developing what was taking place around them, including the embryo welfare state with what was then goose and burial clubs, which says what it was, they saved for Christmas and they saved for burial. And I heard on the very early part of the day, Today programme, it was just before seven o'clock if my memory serves me correctly, it made me feel poorly getting up at that time. I used to have to do it all the time as a minister, but I don't like it now. Um, uh, about how many people uh, are not preparing or have no resources for their burial, and how local authorities are having to effectively, let me use the term, create paupers' graves for them. Uh, it's been 300 in my own city over the last two years alone. Um, and we need to get back to how we can do things at a level that people can understand. Again, I won't go tonight into the issues of the welfare state, but one of the issues that we really do need to connect with is the agreement of those who can afford to, to actually be prepared to support and help those who at that moment in time can't. And reciprocity is perhaps a word that we need to I don't know, let's find another word, but I can't think of one. <laughs> let's make reciprocity mean something, because the other bit of all this agenda is we, we don't speak the right language, so people glaze over. When I was a young councillor, I went along to my branch meeting, and I was really proud of a letter I'd just had in the local newspaper, the Shepherd Star, and I said, I said to one of the ladies next to me, what do you think of my letter in the Star? She said, uh, well, I'd think something of it if I understood a word you were saying. <laughs> uh, of course, I was writing in Guardianese at the time, uh, and I, you know, I still do. So we've got to find a way of speaking to people where they're at and what they understand, and then bring it alive for them so that they understand that they can, they can make a difference. They can actually turn things around. Now, I did mention celebrity only because 
I think um, that we need satire. We need to be able to take the mickey, but we need to do so in a way that actually isn't destructive. You can do it without the sneer, and you can have comedy without the just straight abuse. I don't know whether you picked this up, but is it me getting old? But some comedy lately, both on television and radio, is just abuse. I, it's not, people just say vile things about other people. And I th if I thought it was funny, I'd understand why they did it, but it isn't all that funny. I've got a snip from Mock the Week, which wasn't actually played, or a little bit of it was played, where they were having a go at me not being able to see. Now, I've always been able to take the mickey out of myself, uh, and I've not made not being able to see a, a great issue. But actually, you do wonder about people a little bit, don't you, when, when they have to do that. Is it that they're not good comedians, or is it that they, they, they're on something? Anyway, we won't go into that too much. That's, that's, was that point four or five in Christian's list? Um, now, contradictions um, abound. You know, there, there are three ways in which you, rough ways in which you can look at uh, the way in which we operate government. You can look at it in one sort of top-down way, which is that um, government is elected, the manifesto spelt out what was going to be done, uh, government to uh, get the first Queen's speech underway, legislation's passed, the message is passed down, uh, the struggle begins to get delivery uh, operating and the machinery of government to actually work. Uh, and after a number of years, now the fixed term parliaments, after five years, the judgment's made as to whether the government, or the, in this case the coalition, have done the business. Uh, again, I'm, we haven't got time for coalition government tonight, but I will make a speech in due course about the nature of what coalition government does to political parties uh, and to the electoral process, because you're never entirely sure what it is you're going to get, and you're never entirely sure who was responsible for it when you get it, uh, except that as we get nearer to 2015, uh, both members of the coalition government will be spelling out what it was they did and how horrible the others were in stopping them doing it. Anyway, we'll, we'll see. But th there's a top-down <coughs> approach which is paternalistic and well-meaning and obviously intended to make a difference. There's those who believe that getting into government is really about uh, freeing the market and facilitating the market and is, re is only really at its most fundamentals about uh, defence and foreign policy and protection of uh, the realm and the things that government simply have to do because there's no other way of doing it. Um, they do get into contradictions. I won't use a domestic example, but take the Tea Party in the United States. They're, they're fully in favour of this libertarianism, uh, unless they don't like the lifestyle uh, and the social uh, freedoms of people around them, and then they'd like to restrict them in terms of um, their sexuality uh, or, or abortion or similar measures. or they're very strongly against big government unless it's providing tax breaks for corporates or defence spending in their particular state. So, you know, we get these contradictions. My third, which is, as you'll gather, I, I rather like, is enabling government, which sees the process of election as a logical outcome of wider engagement and participation. And that actually the, the government then turns to how can we develop the potential of individuals, which is of course about things like education and support for family and work to avoid people's deterioration and breakup of their lives through, through drugs. But it's also about how you stimulate things like volunteering and the operation of civil society. It's about how you work with people on reducing their dependence on debt and that brings in all, all, all those issues uh, around uh, the lending and the problems that people are experiencing. But it's also a challenge to people because, you know, uh, this £1.4 billion pounds worth of personal debt that Christian referred to is also matched by 
the way in which we as politicians don't challenge the electorate in return. Um, we don't say, do we, that part of the build-up of the problem to 2007 in this country, obviously there were corollaries with subprime mortgage lending in the United States and elsewhere alongside it, but when people voted to demutualize their building societies, and they did, they were given a vote, they voted because they were being offered a bond, and they received a bond, and on the whole, they spent it. And with it went the mutuality and the solidity of people putting on deposit money that they knew was going to be lent to other people, including themselves, for actually being able to buy a house. And when that stability went, government didn't put something in its place. But who was to blame? I mean, who actually could you ask to put their hands up and say was to blame? Well, we all were. But actually, you know, the individuals who voted to demutualize their building society when they got uh, savings in there had a part to play in that. And I think sometimes we in politics have got to challenge people uh, as well as be extremely nice to them uh, and, uh, and, and try and win their votes. So, uh, what do we do? Well, firstly, we've got to reach those people who never vote uh, and it's increasing uh, all the time. There was a slight blip in 2010 because I think people were quite angry and voting went up slightly on 2005, but it is a miserable um, three out of five. Uh, and with young people, there is a very real worry. The Hansard <coughs> Society uh, survey last year, compared to 2010, saw a drop in the under 30s of those who said they would definitely vote in 2015 from 30% to 12%. I mean, that is staggering. Uh, with the uh, population as a whole, it had dropped, uh, again, worryingly, from 58%, which was roughly the turnout in the last general election, to 41%. Now, I think things will improve as the debate hops up between now and 2015. I certainly hope so. But actually, these figures are extremely concerning and they're reinforced by the social trends material that came out very recently. And if we don't get people to feel that it's something to do with them and that they will vote, then of course they're passing their tiny bit of influence to other people who do. In other words, those who are in the know, those who understand the importance of government, of formal politics, uh, will increasingly be the ones that all parties turn to, which is why it is so difficult to have a dialogue about um, leave, leave the state pension aside for a moment, but uh, the other elements of what is made available for those in retirement, whatever their income. Um, it is difficult because older people vote in very large numbers um, and they expect government to protect them and they have one or two really good cards in their hand like I've worked all my life for this, like I fought in the war or my father did or my mum worked in a factory in the war and we deserve it. So, you know, it's very hard to argue with this and every time somebody does raise it, they get a good drubbing. Now, I'm not in favour of targeting older people in terms of austerity. I'm just in favour of a fair distribution of the pain and ensuring that people understand what difference it makes if they engage rather than disengage. I'm a board member now of the National Civil Citizen Service, which the coalition government are heavily funding. I'm not just there as the Labour Party member to ensure that this has a life after 2015, I assure you. Um, I'm there because I really want to make it work and because I've been involved in stimulating and supporting volunteering and citizenship all my life and because I want it to be connected to citizenship in the school curriculum and the drive for volunteering in adult life. I want to connect it to the work that I'm doing along with Conservative and Liberal co-chairs in um, work with the 
Charities Aid Foundation on what, what stimulates giving, what makes different generations give differentially and how can we encourage people to give their time as well as their money. The, these things really matter because if you can get people to feel that they are active citizens, that they can bring about change, that they can make a difference in their own lives but primarily in the lives of others, then we've cracked it because people will understand that the cynics are wrong, that influence does exist, that they can have common cause with others, that they will change the world for the better. And whatever their political outlook, and this is not confined to any political party, they will be able to distinguish those who are cynically using them, like UKIP, uh, in order to be able uh, to translate uh, their frustrations into personal success for people who know perfectly well that their promises won't be fulfilled, which brings me back to the question of honesty and transparency. And I just want to finish on this. You know, people say, and I've heard it during the course of today in debating this little contribution, they say, well, you know, the politicians of today, and they, they refer to those in the coalition and the opposition of today, so I'm not taking this personally, they say, you know, they don't stand up to the great politicians of the past. They're not a patch on them. Well, you know, I'd like some of the politicians of the past uh, to be reincarnated, because I'd like to see them deal with the issues of today, with 24-hour, 70-day-a-week news, with Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to see them deal with the transparency and lack of deference, which both of which are absolutely crucial to a properly functioning <coughs> democracy, but didn't exist. You know, even the big figures of the past had all sorts of things going on. I don't just mean in their personal, um, very personal lives, which should remain personal, but in terms of <coughs> who, was, who was bankrolling them, who bought them um, country estates. I'm talking about both party, both major parties now. By the way, oh, all three, because of course there was Lloyd George, <laughs> who, who knew my father. Um, uh, so all three parties had very major figures. <clears throat> if they'd had to register their interests, or if they'd had the scrutiny, quite rightly, of the modern media, wouldn't have lasted five minutes. So I think we should set aside that there was a golden age of great figures. They were people of their time, and they stood out as people of their time, but in some ways they were very fortunate. Uh, and in some ways we are very fortunate because a transparent, honest, open democracy with a media that's prepared to take that into account and explain and inform rather than just trash will in the end end up with a much more vibrant and uh, functioning democracy in which, and I have to believe this, don't I, in the end we'll come through this difficult period of mistrust and cynicism and we'll get back to a healthy disregard for those with pomposity, we'll get healthy scepticism and we'll get uh, a little bit of good comedy that when we feel that we're getting above ourselves takes us down a peg or two. And if we can get to that point, then we'll have a really engaged and supportive public alongside those of us who have the temerity to be involved heavily in formal politics and the benefit of being paid to do it. Thank you very much.